Welcome to the Tonestone Podcast. I'm Garrett Ryan, and my guest today is Dr. Adrian Goldsworthy. Dr. Goldsworthy earned his PhD at St. John's College, Oxford, in ancient history, and taught for a few years before beginning his career as a writer. Um, he has written more than a dozen nonfiction works in ancient history, including The Complete Roman Army and best-selling biographies of Augustus, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra. Today, however, we're going to focus on his most recent nonfiction work, a double biography of Philip II of Macedon and his famous son, Alexander the Great. Um, Dr. Goldsworthy, welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it is my pleasure. So as you note in your introduction, there are many biographies of Alexander, uh, many biographies. I think I have three or four on my shelf already. Um, but there are far fewer of Philip, his father. Um, what motivated your discussion, or your decision rather, to discuss Philip and Alexander together? Well, I have to admit, it was actually the publishers asked me to do a book. <laughs> and if they'd asked me would I write a book on Alexander, I certainly would have said no. Mm. But when they said Philip and Alexander, the brain started ticking away. And I thought, actually, that's interesting because Philip is the forgotten man. You know, he's, mm. the, he's the essential part of the story. It couldn't have happened for Alexander if Philip hadn't done all those decades of preparation. But we remember Philip as the, the one-eyed, limping, drunken old mm -hmm. man. Um, at the start of Alexander's story, who sort of has to die so we can get into the action. Um, right. And you forget just how much things had changed. And also, it's the speed of it all. You know, we used to Alexander, the young hero. He goes off, conquers the greater part of the known world in less than a decade, and then dies really young. So it's spectacular, but it's quick. But when you think about it, Philip's only king for about 20-odd years. So there are mm. plenty of people alive who can remember a time when Macedonia just didn't matter at all. And suddenly you've gone to the point where they've overthrown the greatest empire in the world, they're dominating the Greek world, they're dominating, you know, the Macedonian armies are in India. All <laughs> of that happens. It's, it's something about the speed of it I really wanted to convey doing this. So the, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yes, Philip is actually a vital part of the story. And it's something that, again, the general audience doesn't know about. The specialists mm -hmm. will know about the importance of Philip, at least some of it, but even they haven't necessarily sat down and worked out what happens when. And the big problem with, with writing about any period of history is hindsight. We know mm -hmm. what happened. And whilst it's obvious to say that, when it's something as spectacular as this, it can all seem very inevitable because it's so familiar. Mm -hmm. So part of it, to go back to Philip's story, when it starts, the world is so fundamentally different that it just seemed like an interesting, a story to tell that hadn't been told before. So that's, that's what always you know, gets you as an author, particularly for, I try to write books for anyone who's interested enough to see it on the shelf and think, oh, I'd like to know more about that and pick it up. And I hope that even without any background knowledge, they can actually follow it. So mm -hmm. that it's trying to reach that wider audience to tell people there's a lot more to history that's really exciting and interesting. And that's worth knowing about. So all of those things came together and it, it, it became a project I really wanted to do from, as I say, somebody else actually coming to me and saying, do you fancy this? Hmm. Yeah, and it was actually. I think putting those, those stories together did convey the breath, the, the breakneck pace of all that, that amazing change. You know, we, we always read in our Kazakh program, you know, Demosthenes and his shrill denunciations of Philip especially. Um, and it begins to make more sense when we think about how awesomely unfamiliar it was for a Macedonian king to suddenly be making the rules in Greece, um, let alone his son conquering, like you said, out to, you know, the uttermost east. Um, so just fascinating. And I think it, it works very well as, as a joint story, yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. well, it is just, it's that shock. You know, people would say, mm -hmm. Macedonia? Who on earth cares what's going on? And that, that was the right, point right. of trying to make that, you know, when Philip's born, who's going to care? outside the mm -hmm. Macedonian aristocracy and elite itself, particularly as he's the younger son. You know, he's not in clear right. line. It, it, it takes a lot of other people getting killed for him to get there. <laughs> so it, it, it is that, but it's that, that's the problem. We know that Macedonia is going to become the dominant power, but everybody else just didn't have a clue. And it's in the same way that you feel, you know, in the build up to the Second World War, mm -hmm. a lot of people in Britain and America couldn't take Japan seriously because they had this idea, well, it's just some backward kingdom in the middle of nowhere, ignoring mm -hmm. the decades of progress and development and expansion. So mm -hmm. there, there's an element where you still think, well, you know, we don't need to be as careful preparing to fight these people as we do, say, fighting the Germans, because somehow it'll be all right. It's that level of change 
and mm-hmm. suddenly they really humiliate you. You know, they they run rings around you because right. and that makes it worse because you don't expect it. Well, absolutely. Yeah, nobody saw Philip coming. You know, even when it was already a well-equipped kingdom, just being to make inroads in central Greece. Um, and yes, it is, you know, thinking from a source perspective, you know, obviously all of our sources are written much later in the case of Alexander and Philip as well, from most cases. Um, and that, of course, uh, you know, they're writing with that, that, that hindsight, you know, that they have the, the glory is blinding them to uh, what, what came before. And, and on that note, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, no. I, I, well, I was simply yes. saying you've even got Alexander mm-hmm. consciously making his own reputation, trying to make his version yes, of history. Right. So it, it's... Mm-hmm. As an active player and being ridiculed later in ancient history, you know, people like Augustus look back and think, well, Alexander mm-hmm. got the court historians to exaggerate so much, and in the end, right, that reflected right. badly on him. So we don't do that. We do something else. But mm-hmm. you, you are dealing with that. People tend to forget, and they tend to be a little bit naive in saying, oh, well, you know, Arians relying on um, mm-hmm. Ptolemy, and Ptolemy was there, and all this sort of right, thing. Right. But we don't have Ptolemy. We have a 400 years later, somebody writing, right, right. drawing upon that and other sources and thinking very much in a second century AD mm-hmm. Greco-Roman senator's perspective of the world. Right, right. So everything has changed so much. And again, you often see it in analysis of the, the Persian war effort against Alexander, this sort of sense of mm-hmm. you know, why are they being so dumb as to fight this man? You know, you're fighting <laughs> Alexander the Great. You must know you're going to lose. Right, but right. They don't because he's not Alexander the Great. It's Philip right. the father is famous, but now dead. Some youngster mm-hmm. with no record at all has come along. Why on earth should you be frightened of this person? In the same way that Demosthenes can think, well, Alexander's dead. That's it for Macedonia. You know, they're never going to find mm-hmm. another man like him. It'll go back to being what it used to be and what it should always have been. This sort of right. um, kingdom rent by infighting, obscure, picked on by everybody else. So, mm-hmm. so yes, the source is are a huge problem. Um, even compared, I mean, it's always the case with ancient history that there are so many things you don't know and mm-hmm. that you'd love to know and that you never get the broader perspective of anyone outside the elite, what they think about things, mm-hmm. um, their involvement. You know, you'd love to have a memoir of some of Alexander's soldiers or some of the, the Greek allies who went along with them, that sort of thing. But in the same way, you never get the view from the ranks of the Roman army. It, it's just mm-hmm. not there. You never get the full Persian perspective on right. Just how does this seem, you know, from the perspective of, say, somebody in one of the the eastern satrapies who's such a long mm-hmm. way away from it all? You know, should, would you really be that worried for quite a while as to what's happening? Yes, there's always stuff on the Mediterranean coast. You know, you've had the Ionian Rebellion before. Mm-hmm. All these problems. It's it's not a big deal. But we don't. We have to speculate. You have to try and ask the questions as to how would it seem to these people. But you're never going to get their version of it, nor are you going to get the really detailed, reliable official documents giving you dates and times and Mm -hmm. statistics and amounts and this sort of thing. So there's there's always a lot of guesswork. With Alexander and Philip, it's even worse because Philip in particular, although he tried to have his story told, none of the the histories of his day have survived. Mm -hmm. What we have that's contemporary is very hostile. Um, right. you know, Demosthenes is obviously not a balanced source in terms of <laughs> partly because as well he's someone who you know Philip becomes more and more important to him because he needs an enemy to fight he needs right. to be able to stand up and make these speeches about the great threat so he can become somewhat obsessive um, which may not always represent just how other Athenians are thinking at that time and clearly the actions of mm-hmm. Athens when they don't always do what Demosthenes recommends or that anybody who's um, hostile to Macedonia does and you can't just take the Mas- the uh, d- you know Demosthenes explanation of this well they've all been bribed you know if they're not don't agree with me then they must be corrupt <laughs> Philip must support right. them so you get you get those glimpses of what a voice is saying at the time but it's so partial and there is so much that's lost um, where you know there are plenty of years in Philip's life where we don't actually know where he was and what he was mm-hmm. doing. That's never the case with Alexander. We've always got a pretty good idea of where he is month to month and sometimes even day to day. Mm-hmm. With Philip, there are gaps, particularly when he doesn't, he's not doing anything directly involving the Greek cities of the south. If he's gone into Illyria or Thrace, mm-hmm. people in Athens don't care. You know, they're not bothered. They're not talking about it. They're not worried. They've got only the haziest idea of the geography, whether political or physical, right, right. some of these places. So they're not interested. So you, again, you get this this very partial sense. So it's it's very difficult 
um, all I think you can do as a historian is be honest about it, not pretend that, oh, we can sift through these sources to find their sources and then we can judge how mm-hmm. reliable we think they might be and therefore this is right and this is wrong. Mm-hmm. Yes, fine to speculate, but make clear that it's speculation. Make clear what we don't know. Make clear what we're guessing and try to ask the appropriate questions, even if you can't get a firm answer. Because mm-hmm. then at least you're talking about the sort of problems, the, the sort of issues and what was happening. Yes, you know, I think that I, I've fallen into that, uh, you know, the old Quellen Forschung trap myself, you know, <laughs> thinking, you know, like in a good 19th century German, that it's mm. possible to see like through a mirror, through, you know, whether it's uh, Plutarch's life or Arian, you know, back into the Hellenistic sources. And of course, like you say, they're being mediated in all sorts of ways by that author's concerns and blindnesses. And of course, again, you know, the great shining memory of Alexander, you know, blinding everything mm. else well, that would happen at the same time. The other thing is, is that all these authors, they're just human beings in the first place. They're not mm-hmm. necessarily very consistent. I mean, I, I've become less and less um, convinced by that whole approach. I mean, I was always skeptical, but the more I've written, the more I think I'm not sure anybody could go back, look at my stuff, mm-hmm. even with the footnotes and necessarily know why I was saying it that way or what I was doing, <laughs> because these right. books develop and things I wrote several years ago, I can barely remember now. They're not as familiar as they were because you've, you've moved on to the next thing. So, and I do notice that when I'm proofreading or checking copy edits, certain expressions, certain ways of framing a paragraph, framing a sentence, you'll do a lot for a few days or a week, but then mm-hmm. it doesn't reappear. So the idea right. that you can see from a construction, oh yes, this is certainly so-and-so, <laughs> I just don't believe at all. I, I don't think real authors write like that. Well, yes, you always hear like like, like Diodorus Siculus, like, like you were mentioning, mm-hmm. you know, this often, you know, pilloried as this, you know, the hodgepodge author mm-hmm. who's taking all of his, you know, just transcribing sources left mm-hmm. and right. And like you said, people just don't actually work this way, even in the ancient worlds. You know, he probably is have it, you know, a scroll in front of him somewhere, but he's still, you know, a human being with his own perspective, his own style. Mm. And um, so, yeah, like you say, uh, that Alexander and especially Philip are opaque for this reason, you know, despite their great fame. And um, do you have any strategy when you're writing this book for how to manage this kind of welter of sources? It's, I mean, it's different with each project, really, but you've always got similar problems it's just they vary to degree as mm. to, to what you've got i think it, it's trying to be i like to think of it as writing history with the the sort of scaffolding still in place you're building a structure mm-hmm. but you're showing how you do it so that the reader can sense whether this is yes we could be very confident this is what happened or this might be i know it, it frustrates i mean i know i've got copy edits of a book coming through next month and mm-hmm. I know that they will be raised time and time again. Do you have to say might have been, perhaps, <laughs> possibly, all those qualifications, all right. the conditionals? But if you're honest, you've got to. And mm-hmm. the big danger is to create a Philip or an Alexander in your mind and then just assume that you know them as a person. So therefore, if mm-hmm. there's a problem, if there's a mystery, you have a sense, well, this is what my Philip or my Alexander would have done in that right. those circumstances or Parmenio or any of the others and then assume that that's, they did that. Mm-hmm. It's be- far better to admit that when we come to personal motivation, we really don't know what any of this meant to Alexander or Philip. You know, we don't know at which point um, Philip felt himself secure or whether he's still the the young king with a kingdom that looks as if it's about to be dismembered and it's just mm. okay i'll win this campaign you know i mean again it's um from a much later source from justin but the idea that he is he's investing the spoils of each campaign to fight the next one like a businessman you know there's this sort of mm-hmm. s- scornful sense of the ancient elite that he isn't fighting war like a proper gentleman <laughs> but he's doing it like a business <laughs> right right but there is that sense that each stage you know you take a step but you're always thinking of the next one but you're not really thinking of two or three down the line other than in the vaguest sense because you are making it up as you go along to some extent <laughs> so it's trying to do that um lack of inevitability, lack of um, knowledge as well. You know, these people are operating. So it's trying, again, I think at heart, I'm trying to write a biography as if it was a biography of somebody from the 20th or 19th century where you have the sources. Mm -hmm. Ask the same questions. Be honest with the fact that you can't get the answers. But at least try and remember, you know, it's important to me with all the biographies I've done to know 
where the person was and what they were doing at any time. Because you can, say with Julius Caesar, you have all this debate mm -hmm. about what he was trying to do as dictator, what he was doing those last months of his life before the assassination. Similarly with Alexander, you know, what are his plans right. for the Persian Empire once he's conquered it, whilst he's campaigning in Afghanistan, this sort of thing. When you actually look at where these people are and what they're doing, you start to realize they don't have a lot of time to do this <laughs> right. abstract planning, to sit down. You know, this isn't ever a, an open book. They say, okay, I've got this empire. What do I want it to be? You know, how am I going to merge the different nationalities? How am I going to do yeah, it? Right, right. It's, not, it's, one, it's cobbling it together. It's one decision after another. Whilst you're traveling, in Alexander's case, you're traveling, you're fighting, you're out there riding or marching at the head of a column in all weathers. You're living under canvas, you're eating, you know, you're feasting, you're, you're doing so much that you're not someone who's just sitting in the comfort of an armchair thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way, it surprised me when I did the biography of Augustus, when I, it had never really occurred to me that he spends most of his reign away from Rome and Italy, mm -hmm. and that he travels far more than any emperor, Hadrian's the only one who comes close. Mm -hmm. But this is somebody who, again, is always moving. And you're thinking of a court that's moving around. It's a very different image to this sense of somebody sitting there on the Palatine Hill waiting for the world to come to them, which <laughs> right. is what some later emperors do. But it isn't, again, you're assuming, you know, you tend to get used to studying a period. And you think, well, it's always been like that because that's how, what it becomes. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, with Alexander, you know, the, he didn't know how this was going to turn out. Mm -hmm. um, and Philip the same. And Philip certainly didn't expect to get murdered, you know, when he's, he's <laughs> right. in his forties at that age. And given that, one thing that surprised me with um, these um, th this generation really is how old a lot of the Macedonian kings, but also the other leaders, you know, Bardalis of Illyria, and I was, mm -hmm. when you get these men in their eighties and nineties who are still rulers and still apparently active campaigning and mm -hmm. off in the field with their armies. It reminds you that, you know, Philip isn't that old by the standards of his family. If if somebody doesn't kill them, the Argeid royal family tend to last a very long time in mm. a way that Roman senators don't seem to. But perhaps that's because life yeah. is even more dangerous for them. So <laughs> yeah, right. It, it's again, sometimes you're coming with assumptions from how you studied the ancient world that prove not to be borne out by the evidence you have for that particular period. So it's it's trying to let every period be itself mm -hmm. and understand it on its own terms. Well, yes. You, know, you mentioned how you know there's this ten this temptation to create your own Alexander, your own Philip. You know, to assume you understand your subject, and I'm sure that you know, having read you know all the sources, that, that can be a very powerful temptation. You know, you have so much information, you know, flowing around your mind, and I think that so many authors do succumb to this temptation and just out just create. You know, I understand Alexander. You know, he's a sociopath, or you know, he's mm -hmm. a glorious conqueror, or whatever else. Um, Oh, it is you you mm -hmm. tend to you're spending a lot of time at least in your head with these people right. so you do tend to develop a sense and you with a project that's large, you know the i wrote this book over about three years um you're spending a long time and you you inevitably either like or dislike them and i mm -hmm. found i was surprised when i did the biography of antony and cleopatra my respect for antony declined steadily the more i learned <laughs> because i learned about him and you thought this is a man with a great reputation but he never really lives up to it mm -hmm. alexander i've always I, I is someone i can't pin down um <laughs> and i decided at the end I, i'm not sure i really li you probably don't want to be too near someone like that <laughs> yeah right um, philip was yeah, easier the... to admire even though you could tell pretty clearly you know, this is not a nice person mm -hmm. but again the circumstance of the fourth century bc or much of the ancient world particularly at that level of political leadership don't really encourage very nice people as we oh, would right. understand them yeah i mean the nice guy finishes last or just gets speared in this case you know and uh yeah, I think there's often this this temptation, or acknowledged or otherwise, by authors, even those who are trained as historians, to judge these people just you know overtly by our our modern standards. And by those standards, you know, yeah, you don't want to hang out with Alexander yeah. or Philip. You know, he, 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 he kills people at dinner sometimes, you know. And uh, but right, you just say you know, treating them as kings of the fourth century BC, um, far as we can do that with our modern perspective, is a much more fruitful um, approach, I think. Yes, I mean, a historian, you, you really are there, you're trying to understand. You do mm -hmm. have to remember that these are living, breathing, flesh and blood human beings. You know, don't turn them into archetypes, don't turn them mm -hmm. into these sort of machines that have certain names or, or are simply crudely evil or good. Mm -hmm. um, because, 
you know, they're, they're a mess like most of us. That, and <laughs> but they how these are extreme situations. And once once you take the step along these political routes, once you want to be the king of Macedonia and you want to survive, you know, it does become a life or death thing. Right. Almost every decision you make, and it is extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. So it isn't. Um, you know, it's all very well to judge it from our our perspective in safety. But again, it, it, it's trying to not turn them into these creations of yourself. And I, I think, oddly enough, because I, as a sideline, I write some novels, mm -hmm. I think it's easier for me to remember the line between fiction and nonfiction, <laughs> in right. a sense, because I know that this is what I'm doing for this part, main bulk of the year. I'm doing something different. So I'm I'm less inclined to do the, the sort of pen portraits and purple prose, which can read very well, but is often misleading. You know, if you sum right. up an individual with a line or two, it's very often a gross oversimplification. Mm -hmm. And it can then mislead your narrative because it makes, again, everything seem inevitable. That, okay, yes, this person is going to do that. Um, well, yes, and of course, it's a very ancient thing to do, of course, is that those purple mm. prose portraits, you know, we're kind of following our, our classical predecessors there. Um, and so to, to return to Philip, um, who of course is so often overshadowed by Alexander, just by the virtue of, you know, being, you know, coming before this, you know, glorious blinding figure, um, you know, what in your part, what in your opinion set Philip apart from his predecessor? What allowed him to make Macedon into this superpower? Was it just circumstance, personal qualities, some combination of these? I suppose the broader background is, well, really two things. On the one hand, he inherits a Macedonia that is really in trouble. You know, his mm -hmm. brother's just been defeated and killed along with the, the pick of the Macedonian army by the Illyrians. And the older brother than that was murdered in the way that so often seems to happen to the family. This is deeply insecure. You've got the Athenians trying to steal your land. You've got Thracians. You've got Illyrians. You've got everybody threatening you. However, there's a broader context that compared to a generation or so before, particularly go back to the 5th century, Greece doesn't have the great powers that it did have, southern Greece. You know, mm -hmm. Athens is weaker than it was. It is still an important city. It's still got all these imperial interests around the, the Dardanelles and that area. It's, it's trying to prey on Macedonia. It wants its resources. It wants its timber. But it isn't quite the superpower that it had been until mm -hmm. the end of the Peloponnesian War. Thebes has had its day, but is fading. And Sparta doesn't really take much interest that far north unless it's trying to mess up the Athenians. So mm -hmm. you've actually got a Greek, a southern Greece that is less stable and less balanced between a few great cities. It's much more, much less predictable in a sense mm -hmm. as to what's going on. So that means that when he does take on Athens, which he will do at various stages, he isn't quite taking on Athens that used to be. And Athens isn't as focused. He's just one of many little problems they've got. And they haven't really got the resources to sort out all of them. So I think that's part of it. But it's also Philip from the beginning has to succeed just to survive. I mean, there's a very real prospect in 359 that Macedonia is going to be dismembered. That large chunks mm -hmm. of it will be taken permanently by more powerful neighbors. So Philip has to try and turn that around. So he's fighting for survival for the first few years and then has to do this, make one victory, build into the next one. So he's partly creating a good way of fighting and winning wars and then going on to fight the next one and the next one. I think the pressure on him to do that is something new. Macedonia probably hasn't quite been at such a low ebb ever before. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I say, the whole wider world is much less predictable. It's much less stable. So there are opportunities. So I think some of it, it it's... It's it's chance, but it's also his ability. He clearly is able to do something to turn around the fortunes very quickly. You know, he's able to go back and beat the Illyrians within a year with this newly recruited, newly inspired, partly reformed army, a process mm -hmm. that's going to take a long time. He's also able to negotiate. You know, he shows this knack for dealing with some of his opponents by buying them off or doing a deal with them or making them realize that there's actually a more attractive enemy for them to go and fight somewhere else. He has that talent. I mean, you have the story, again, like all these sayings that someone in the ancient world is supposed to have said, the, the claim mm -hmm. that Philip was prouder of his diplomatic successes than his military victories ought to be true because he certainly has right. a lot of them. And he does, and that's partly because of his weakness. You know, he can't dominate mm 
right from the start. And for quite a long time, he does not have the military might. He doesn't have the economic might. All of that is put together very slowly. You don't just snap your fingers and suddenly there's this reformed <laughs> superb Macedonian army. Right. It's a very gradual process. So I think it's it's a combination of a remarkably talented, determined, and again, something the ancients would have recognized, lucky individual. Right. He gets away with it. And he leads, as far as we can tell, in the same sort of bold, heroic fashion that Alexander will display, but doesn't die. He takes wounds, <laughs> yes. but he gets away with it. You know, another big thing, we, we, we again tend to take that for granted, but these people did take a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. And obviously that gives them more confidence every time they survive, but it's bound to take a toll. And there is always the danger, the possibility that someone might have killed them or crippled them early on, in which case history would have gone a very, along a very different mm -hmm. path. So I think it's, it's, it's a mixture of this wider context, the talent of Philip, and then he's got to keep on winning. I mean, there is a relentless mm -hmm. quality about those, those campaigns really that continues almost throughout the reign. It, the pace slackens a little bit later on when he doesn't have to win a war every year. But at the beginning, again, it's got to be this win a victory, take the spoils from that to go and fight another opponent, deal with them, mm -hmm. because he certainly isn't short of opponents. And every time he wins, the more important he becomes, and therefore people start to see, particularly the Athenians, hmm, maybe this man's dangerous. Maybe we need to do something about this. Right. So success gives you more benefits, makes you stronger, but also attracts attention, much of it hostile. You were saying before about how these men are in the grip of events at all times. You know, they're constantly, you know, in the thick of it. And Philip, for his first decade especially, must have been constantly, you know, at least just kind of struggling to keep his kingdom from being totally submerged by these hostile forces. And also this contingency that he was never killed despite leading from the front all the time. You think of Alexander at the Granicus or something, you know, with the Cletus stopping the Persian just before, yeah. you know, cuts Alexander's head off. Um, right, you know, one spear stroke away and history is very, very different. Um, so returning to what you mentioned about this, these reforms of the Macedonian army, which was, like you said, a piecemeal and slow process, we think of the Macedonian phalanx as the great military machine, you know, of the Hellenistic age. And of course it, it was in many ways. Um, can you talk about what, how this worked, why it was so effective when it was fully developed and how we think it came about? Again, one of the problems is we, we know quite a bit about the system as it ends up, when mm. you get to that point where, in some cases still under the Romans, Greek authors are writing these manuals mm. about how a pike phalanx should drill in a formation that nobody's using anymore and has for <laughs> centuries. Right. But it's it's considered to be this is you know this is how warfare ought to be. This is mm -hmm. um, you have to be a little bit careful because, as I say again, don't assume that Philip somehow waves a magic wand and has this great army. This <laughs> is a very slow, gradual process. Macedonia has long had a reputation for having good cavalry, and that continues, but they seem to become more effective and better. The big difference is the infantry that in the past have been treated with disdain, really, by the rest of, of, of the Greek world. You know, the ideal soldier elsewhere is the hoplite, traditionally the citizen soldier, the farmer who takes the shield down, spear down, helmet, goes off to war for a few mm -hmm. weeks or days, or however long it takes. And they fight ranked up close together in the phalanx, and they're watched by their neighbors. Therefore, there's all this, this social pressure on yourself to, mm -hmm. ex to um, excel. And that's turned into, there have always been mercenaries there, but it's become more and more important. His armies have got bigger into the fourth century. There seem to be more and more professional soldiers. But of course, that's always been a problem because the Greek states fight each other so much and have are so prone to stasis, to revolution. Mm -hmm. There's always plenty of people who've been exiled or chased out of their own city who don't know anything else other than fighting. So, you know, the Greek mercenaries that are there and the Persians have relied on for years, but so, you know, they turn up in Sicily, they turn up in Italy, they're all over the place. They're, and they're, they're hired by other Greek states. So there's been this sort of semi-professional tradition as well. But it's all really based around the idea of someone with enough property to be able to train themselves. You know, the idea that you're you're training physically in the gymnasia, but also you're learning how to use weapons, you're turning up, and it's part of being a citizen. Macedonia doesn't have that civic tradition in the same way. Their cities aren't like that. They don't have that that class. So they don't have the same mentality, the same tradition. Now, Philip will introduce something different. And again, we can get very caught up with the technology of it. Because obviously the biggest difference is that instead of the, the spear used one-handed, that's maybe, I don't know, eight feet, nine feet long at the most of your average hoplite, is replaced by the sarissa, this two-handed pike that eventually might be anything up to 16 to 21 feet long. Mm 
depending on the, the period. Now, obviously something like that is unwieldy. It requires you to stand very close together with people next to you. Otherwise, your opponent is just going to be able to get past the point and then you're in trouble. So it's, mm. it's a formation to be used en masse. It's a formation where everybody's got to stick together. The big advantage probably at the start is actually it keeps the enemy a long way away. So you don't have to be particularly good at fighting individually <laughs> with spear or sword because they can't get to you. You're just, you need to be strong, you need to stay together and you need to be determined. Another big problem is we don't have good descriptions of any of Philip's battles to know in detail at what stage all these bits of the, the information come in. It's hard to believe that in the matter of a few months, he could have drilled the phalanx that he creates to the level that you see in Alexander's early campaigns when you know you have all these formation changes and the the bit where they um, impress the tribes they're fighting by drilling, oh, right. you know, marching mm -hmm. up and down and racing right, right. and lowering the Surisai and all this sort of thing. And <laughs> you know, the the locals are looking and it is it probably was uncanny to see this. It's something that you couldn't do and done largely in silence, other than very limited orders and the sort of the clash of the equipment as it bumps along. You know, that it's, it's a bit scary. Um but that's not going to be instant. That's going to take a long time. And probably in the early battles, you've got the royal troops that may not be armed that way. You know, they've got all these difficulties about just how um, the sort of the more permanent um, soldiers are armed and whether they're part of the main phalanx or whether they're fighting in a more traditional um, hoplite way. They're probably doing the bulk of the fighting. Philip's genius will lie in two things. One is the battlefield element, whereby he'll combine these much better infantry that get better and better as the years pass. And they um, are combined with the cavalry that are used for shock action at the right moment with other supporting troops, some with missiles, some skirmishes, all this sort of thing. All the allies he'll bring into the army because this is always, other than in the very early days, this is never a predominantly Macedonian force. You know, Again, mm -hmm. it's, it's rather like the Roman army when it's so successful. It relies an awful lot on allies and different people that you, you bolt onto the organization and it seems to function. Philip makes them very good at fighting in battle. He makes them very, very good at marching quickly. And that's one of the biggest things. He changes the pace of warfare. Mm -hmm. And that's in two ways, really. One is because he organizes the supply so that they can eat while they're out there and they're spending longer in the field. And he gets them to move faster so that they can campaign all of the year round or certainly most of the year round in almost any weather, any terrain. They might not be very big forces. They're probably not early on. They might just be a few thousand men in many cases, but they get there and they're in the right place where he wants them to be. And the second major component, the thing we never really think about so much, we just take for granted, is that he learns how to capture fortified places, cities mm -hmm. in particular. And that's something that no one has been very good at doing ever before, particularly in the Greek context and in the Mediterranean context. Sieges have been very long, very difficult operations. Philip develops this system, and he does it partly by hiring these engineers from all over the world, by funding their research, so they can create better artillery, better siege towers, all this sort of thing. But also it's because he can supply the army and because he can keep them in the field for longer, they can stay for weeks or months. And some of the assaults he launches fail, you know, a lot that they're not instances, but he very rarely fails altogether to capture somewhere when he decides to, that he wants to capture it. And that means that a war suddenly becomes far more decisive. Mm -hmm. Because the pattern, you know, you look at it, it's always striking if you go to Greece, or even if you just look at a map, how close together many of the cities are that fight each other generation after generation. <laughs> and you know, every now and again, you'll go out and you'll go and fight them again. But they're still there because you can't mm -hmm. capture them. And you probably you don't really want to, but you also realize, I don't want to sit there for months trying to starve them out. I certainly don't want to try and mm -hmm. climb a ladder and capture the place. Philip can make his war complete because he can go to the, the settlement. And, you know, many of these communities, they're quite small, but he can go there, he can capture the city and he can impose terms or he can force them to surrender. And that means that instead of going back and fighting the same people in a few years' time or 10 years' time or next generation, suddenly they're under your control. You can either colonize them, you can absorb them, or you can turn them into allies that know that you can always get over their walls again if you want to. Mm -hmm. And that fundamentally changes the nature of warfare. And it, it's less dramatic and it's not as well described as the, the sort of the dramatic march and the spectacular battles. But 
it's vital. It makes such a huge difference. Without that, neither Philip nor Alexander could have achieved anywhere near so much. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. It's less about having just longer spears, per se, than it is about having a different uh, mode of warfare, one that is, you know, year-round, one that relies upon a semi-professional force, one that has an actual siege train that can be brought to bear upon any recalcitrant, you know, uh, enemy. Um, and, you know, thinking about just how, how this gathered pace, you know, how we're going from, you know, actions against the Thracians, you know, to being down in Thessaly or the Sacred Wars, mm. and finally, you know, Chironea, actually, you know, mm. essentially opposing one, you know, your one hege hegemony over the rest of Greece. You know, one wonders whether the famous Persian, the Panhellenic Crusade, that Isocrates mm. preached and Philip eventually mm. adopted, is just the next, next logical step. You know, this is all that's left to do, or the next thing that's most obvious for this highly trained force to be launched upon. You, you do wonder. I mean, it, it's, it's again, I'm almost contradicting myself in starting to imply there's an inevitability about events. Of course, but it, right. You do right. feel that Philip's created this kingdom with its, its clearest expression being the military machine of the Macedonian army that mm -hmm. relies on frequent warfare. Because he does keep, you know, he he's makes vast profits in these wars, but he doesn't end up a, a fabulously rich man because he spends it. Mm -hmm. He's very generous rewarding his followers, hence the growth in the number of you know, the, the sort of the senior companions, the people at court, but also the simple number of cavalry he can deploy, the people who've got estates, they've got lands that he's given them, mm -hmm. but also to win favor with allies, to make sure that he's accepted in Thessaly, that he's accepted in Epirus, that he's accepted elsewhere by all these communities. He keeps, as I say, spending so mm -hmm. that you need more money. You need a, a greater source of income. It's you know, it's like this company that's locked in a permanent sort of growth spiral that it's got to keep <laughs> right. on expanding, otherwise it declines. Now that's, I don't think that's a good model for ancient empires in general, though people sometimes start to use it. But in Philip's case, right. in the short term, and of course we don't know what he planned for Persia, how large an expedition he wanted. Was this profit? You know, was there a, a sort of a target Philip had in mind when he would be strong enough where he could actually feel, I don't need to fight so often. Mm -hmm. um, I can simply let the kingdom run itself, let the profits grow. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's all he's really known in his adult mm -hmm. life is fighting or negotiating or threatening you know, diplomacy with the, the, the backing of force behind it. And of course, he's, as I say before, by Macedonian royal family standards, he's comparatively young. And for all his wounds, he's still pretty healthy. He's certainly an active man. So I think it is there. And I, I, it's, I mean, there's clearly been this, you know, this Greek idea of knocking around for a while by the Isocrates and the other Panhellenists mm -hmm. of partly looking around themselves. And, it, 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 you know, why are we fighting each other all the time for <laughs> right. so little gain? Um, but also there's that strange sense, you know, it's almost hearkening back to the good old days. It, it, it's... The great mm -hmm. paradox of Greek history is you have this moment of comparative unity in the, the, the face of the Persian invasions. And, you know, it isn't any coincidence that Herodotus, obviously not from mainland Greece himself, but nevertheless starts to write history at this point. Mm -hmm. They're suddenly seeing themselves in a wider sense in the same way the Romans start writing history after they've defeated Hannibal. They mm -hmm. look around and think, wow, wasn't that amazing? You know, that was terrible. <laughs> it was really scary, but we won. And it's the great story. It's the thing that we keep returning to all the time. So they have that image. But then, of course, in the generations that follow, all the great heroes, and obviously the Thebans had been on the wrong side in the, the first place, <laughs> right. but Athens and Sparta both take money from Persia to fight the other one. And everybody else, all the other Greek states, are quite happy to consider this as a, a normal thing. So there's sudden the evil empire, as they've portrayed it so many times, that was threatening <laughs> to gobble up Greece, destroy the liberty of mankind, all this sort of thing, is suddenly a very handy source of revenue. Um, <laughs> and it's strange that, you know, the, the, the people who pride themselves on their, whether it's the Athenians with Salamis, the, you know, the, the Spartans with Thermopylae, with Plataea, mm -hmm that you're actually taking money from this 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 great enemy to dominate in Greece. So I, you can understand a lot of Greeks looking around and thinking, you know, there's, there's something wrong here. And mm -hmm. then with that arrogance, that, you know, that incredibly Greek sense that you are simply better because you're Hellenic than anyone <laughs> in the world, you know, the, it isn't a very attractive appeal when you look at the details of Isocrates and others. It's basically, right. let's go off and have lots of Persians as slaves so we don't have to work and we can mm -hmm. all become proper civilized Greeks. You know, it, it's quite a, a disturbing idea, by, even by ancient standards. Mm -hmm. But it's just that thought that, well, we're better at fighting than they are. They've got loads of money. 
you know, it's it's pretty much what Attila the Hun was saying to his people <laughs> yes, in the, right. the, the fifth century. <laughs> so you would imagine. So right, it's, right. It's, it's it's that way. But because it's the Greeks doing it, we sometimes accept this sense of well, they are different, and yes, they are just better because they told us so <laughs> than everyone else. But it it's clearly a problem. And you know, you've had um, Jason of Ferrai before. There mm-hmm. are people who are looking and, and wondering how. If you don't dominate in Greece, you're not secure because somebody's going to attack you if they think you're vulnerable. So any individual or power that grows stronger has to sort of keep growing stronger. So they almost all face this same problem as Philip, the sense that if you have really succeeded and you have actually come to dominate Greece, what do you do next? Because Mm -hmm. if you sit around, people will think you're weak. And, you know, they're, these are not people who naturally unify or come together. They really, <laughs> no, no. you know, they don't have that spirit. That, that sense of independence is so strong and so developed. A rivalry, you know, this desire to be mm-hmm. first is so overwhelmingly powerful that um, they're going to keep doing this if given the chance. You know, and speaking of this, this desire, this overweening desire to be first in all things, you know, to Alexander himself. So of course, he succeeds at the age of 20 after Philip is assassinated at his daughter's wedding. And we often assume that Alexander has this, you know, this vision of glory from the beginning, that he's always destined to conquer Persia. And there are all these, you know, anecdotes about his childhood where he's, you know, in, you know inquiring about Persian ambassadors, or whatever else. Um, but you, you wonder, you know, coming to power, you know, as Mr. Besson has poised to begin this expedition into Persia, do you have any option, really? Would it ever occur to him not to launch this expedition? I suspect there's no choice at all. I mean, it, it's right. it, as long as you feel strong enough, you know, he waits that little while because he's got to try and secure his position. Right, right. He doesn't wait long. But part of the army is already there in Asia Minor. You know, mm-hmm. you've already got that advance guard. You're already fighting this war. It's begun. The army is prepared. You've, you know, we're told that Alexander has virtually em- emptied the coffers of the mm-hmm. Macedonian uh, royal family at the start of the expedition. Most of that has probably already happened. You've already... The, the uniting force with all these Greek allies is that let's all go and fight the Persians. Mm-hmm. And we again forget, because he's Alexander the Great, that he is just a kid, that yes, he might have been praised for being brave at Chironea, but there's very little detail as to what he actually did there. He's mm-hmm. done a few things. We don't even know. I mean, this is one of the striking things, whether or not Philip was planning to take him to Persia with him. You know, was he? He's clearly the favored heir at the time, partly because there's nobody else. Right. Um but would that have lasted if Philip had lived on another 20 years? You know, Alexander could have got himself killed as a subordinate fighting in Persia or might have rebelled back in left home in Macedonia because he thought, well, you know, I might as well see what's happening. But I, <laughs> I don't think, I think there is a momentum at that point where, again, he's got to, he's much stronger than Philip was when Philip succeeded to the throne, but he's still got to establish himself. He's got to create that security, that mm-hmm. After all, your father's just been murdered. Whether or not you're involved in it in any way whatsoever, the point is the king of Macedon, the most successful one there's ever been, has just been stabbed to death. This could easily happen to you. You know, so mm-hmm. you can't trust the Macedon. You can't take the Macedonian aristocracy for granted. And the striking thing is there is a gradual change as the years go by, but the army that Alexander leads to Persia is Philip's army. You know, mm-hmm. All the key people, all the senior commanders, they're Philip's men. And a lot of them are Philip's age group or older. Now, again, you've got these surprising, these people in their 70s who mm-hmm. have campaigned, and they're people who can remember the days before Philip and can remember weak Macedonia and can also remember how easy it is to get rid of a king of Macedonia and replace him. <laughs> right, yeah. So, you know, these are all people you cannot take for granted. You cannot expect Alexander again. We know he's Alexander the Great. He's going to be this military genius. They don't. They've seen some promise, but they're also probably not wanting to be that keen to be ordered around by this kid um right. and the whole tradition of the you know alexander suggests something parmenio the voice of caution right, right. and alexander does mm-hmm. the opposite and wins um it's a sort of broader reflection of that uh, again justin okay so it's a much later source but emphasizing that it's mature men that he took as the rank and file soldiers and some of these people are in their 40s you know they're people who fought nearly all the way through philip's reign so it is going to take a while. It's like taking over a, a sports team where you've had, you know, it's been really successful under another captain. Suddenly you're the new guy. Mm-hmm. How do you convince people or any institution, any organization? But this, the stakes are that much higher because this mm-hmm. really is life and death. So, no, I don't think he has any choice at all. I think at that point, it's just a question of making sure that he's secure enough to go. And then he's got to succeed. I mean, I think that's why the 
the Battle of the Granicus happens so mm -hmm. soon and in such an unconventional way. And I don't think the Persians were expecting anybody to be lunatic enough to attack them late in the day across a river. You know, it's, <laughs> right. it's not what normal people do. Why mm -hmm. would you? This is a big risk. But you're taking these risks, and as long as you keep succeeding. But it takes quite a long time before you convince people, and they're not automatically thinking we're Philip's army, before mm -hmm. they start to think of themselves, we are Alexander's army, we are Alexander's noblemen. Um, you know, deep down. Right. Again, I'm, I'm into the speculating of how people are thinking now, which is what I've been telling myself well, I shouldn't you know, be doing. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's irresistible. Um, you know, and, and it's very interesting. I think that so much about Alexander's career makes sense from that perspective, both his mm. supposed paranoia about Philip's officers, you know, Parmenio himself, for example, or Philotus. Um, and of course, right, Granicus, you know, which is a, a, an absurd battle, you know, charging mm. across this high bank of the river and everything else, because he has to prove himself. You know, he's not the great yet. He's just Alexander, mm. Philip's son, trying to prove that he's more than Philip's son. And um, so thinking about, you know, the Great Persian Campaign, um, you, you have a nice part in the book where you contrast the Persian and Macedonian forces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what sort of built-in advantages, as far as those exist in, in warfare, um, does Philip's army, and now it's Alexander's army, um, have over the forces of Darius III? What makes it so uh, successful, I suppose, in these set-piece battles? It has the advantages that it is, in a sense, a practice team. You know, the, mm -hmm. the core of this army are the officers and the rank and file that have been campaigning under Philip and now Alexander for decades in many cases. And they've kept on winning again mm -hmm. and again and again. So you start with that confidence, but you also have the assurance you know each other. You know, Alexander himself is to some extent the unknown quantity. How is he going to behave in charge of the army? Mm -hmm. But everybody else has fought battles, campaigned alongside all these people before. They know their reputation. They know what they'll do. They trust them. I mean, it's striking at the Battle of the Issus. And, and in most of Alexander's battles, you know, he basically, once he's deployed all the pieces, once you've got the build up to the, the charge, there is very little command and control that he can actually do. Mm -hmm. But he relies on the fact that at every level, all along the line, all the officers know their job and they're going to do it. You know, and it's that proven experience that you've already got that's the big difference it's a little bit like hannibal's army when he marches into italy mm -hmm. the core of it are his father's old men and his 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 men that have again campaigned for a long time they're a really well practiced very slick team that know each other trust each other and absolutely believe they're going to win under any circumstances in the persian case there isn't a persian army there is mm -hmm the army you raise for a particular occasion. And that could be drawn from different regions of the empire, depending on the requirement, the scale of the task. So this isn't a unified force. These are people who don't know each other. And because mass, um, the Achaemenid Persian Empire is so huge, you know, lots of people will not know each other personally, mm -hmm. even your aristocracy, let alone lower level commanders. You know, the Issus campaign, the Lone Granicus, is fought by the troops that can get there in time. Mm -hmm. And some contingents will be there at Gaugamela that haven't had time to go all the way from the east, form themselves up and get to the point where they can actually join the main army. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the Persians are learning as they're going along. If they'd had more time, if this had been a prolonged war, the Persian army would probably have become more coherent and improved, mm -hmm. particularly if it could have won a few small successes. It doesn't ever get that chance. Each army that Alexander meets is essentially a different army. Mm -hmm. And there's hardly anybody who knows how the Macedonians fight, know what they're doing. They're also to the, just not, apart from the march to the actual battle itself, that's the only time that army gets to drill together, to work out who's in charge. You know, we read in the Macedonian accounts of the units, particular regiments of the phalanx or um, squadrons of the companion cavalry that by routine are at the head of the column on that particular day. You know, you've got this very sort of practice system. Everybody knows where they should be. Everybody knows on this particular day, all right, that's where we're going to be positioned. That's going to be, mm -hmm. those are the people to our left. Those are the people to our right. This is a very different organization. So it's, you've got that advantage. You've also got the traditional success of hoplite and Greek armies when they've gone east. They fight in a style, this hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're much more enthusiastic than many of the contingents that form the Persian army. And this has been reinforced by the fact that the Persians have so often hired Greek or Greek-style hoplites to do that sort of fighting for them. 
that you haven't really, it's a relatively late development when you try and create your own troops who can do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cultural assumptions as well that you have to get past before people will fight well in that sort of situation. And because you don't have a standing army, because you so rarely need to fight wars, particularly you haven't had to, you know, Darius hasn't had to fight the Macedonians before, nor has any recent Persian king. So you haven't got recent experience of this is how you deal with them. This is how you beat them. The sort of tradition is, well, just hire some Greeks to fight their Greeks and we'll sort <laughs> right. it out that way. Um, <laughs> in the same way that when you fight the steppe nomads in the East, you basically right, right. hire people who are similar. Mm -hmm. They're good at fighting them. Yep, that's fine. That's sorted out. Yeah, yeah. And the empire is big enough and it's wealthy enough to do that. So Alexander has this well-balanced force, which is, doesn't just have that aggression in close combat with the infantry that the, the other Greek armies have had. Now you've got all these extra troops. You've got all the cavalry. You've got this coordinated force. And again, worth emphasizing at this point too, they're very good at sieges. You can't mm -hmm. just hole up behind the walls of a city with your food supplies and wait for them to go away or starve or catch disease because they will capture the place. And it means your bases aren't secure. Your supplies aren't secure. So they will keep on attacking you and they'll keep on attacking you all the year round in the, the pattern that Philip has established. They don't stop. They don't mm -hmm. settle down for winter quarters and rest for five or six months. They are always at your throat, even if they break up into several columns and start dividing. So it's, it's a problem. It isn't really surprising that a Persian king who has only had a, been on the throne a few years has succeeded after the murder of his predecessor, you know, is not from the main line of the Persian royal house because they've been doing their best to wipe themselves out just <laughs> as the Archaeids in Macedonia <laughs> right. have been doing to themselves. That, there, that tendency, so you have an insecure king dealing with a very new problem and then mm -hmm. not being given the time to do it. So there are big advantages for the Macedonians, but the difference is the Persians can afford to lose a battle or two, and it isn't final for Darius until later. If Alexander loses once, or if Alexander dies or is crippled, mm -hmm. what happens next? Because there is no heir. There's no right. obvious successor. And that drive, you know, the Macedonians then go to turn on themselves. So the war could be won that way. Um, or at the mm -hmm. very least, it could be prolonged to the point where the Persians can actually get themselves organized, start to sort of pull together the resources of the empire and do something about it. So... Alexander has advantages, but there's also, it's always a gamble. He has mm -hmm. to keep on winning. I mean, a few very interesting points there. You know, I, I think, I thought immediately when you start describing these, this veteran army that knows it knows its components, knows how to fight, knows how it works best. You know, I think actually from your own works about Caesar's legions at the end of the Gallic Wars, you know, who have, that there are veterans who just, you know, know how to fight mm -hmm. and are, you know, that built an advantage. And even also thinking about the Persian armies, you think about Rome as Parthian opponents who are similar in many ways, the Achaemenid predecessors who, you know, levy these forces right before when the Romans show up, you know, often are kind of local mag magnates, you know, kind of cobbled together into a larger force and are almost always destroyed if they don't, you know, wipe them out with their cavalry charges, you know, uh, Cari style, mm -hmm. because they're not cohesive. Um, but more importantly, your point that this is nothing that they've seen before. This is a new kind of beast and a terrifying one. It's not Xenophon and his 10,000 anymore. It's, you know, this integrated force with cavalry um, that is used to winning and keeps on winning. Yes, exactly. It, it's again, we, but we know that. So therefore you yes. get, you know, occasionally people analyze mm -hmm. and say, well, really, it would have been better. Don't fight them at all. You know, try and cut off their supplies, starve them. You've, mm -hmm. you've got the... Um, the classic case where early on the Greek mercenaries are advising the Persians, this is what you should do. Don't fight them, just starve them out. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Greek sources inevitably present the Greeks as the wisest right, person right. on the... Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's strange if you look at Napoleon's marshals, Marshal MacDonald, because of his Scotch mm -hmm. ancestry, always gets a really good write-up in Anglophone <laughs> accounts, even though he didn't really achieve all that much. And right, it, right. It's, but it's just the sense, oh, he was probably on the, you know, I, I'm sure he knew what he was doing. Um, there, there is that sort of strange snobbery as well that's there. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it is. It, it's, it's a very, it's an exceptional army, and this is all new. And what Darius does is quite logical, in the Persian response. You know, yes, you gather the local forces, the satraps don't think they're going to fight the Granicus, but it happens and they, they lose. They're not really prepared for it. But then the Issus campaign, okay, I've got a big army. 
the Persians outmaneuver the Macedonians. They're, you know, it's a surprising thing that Alexander is able to turn around and attack them in a position of their own choosing and win. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to expect that. Nothing up till now has shown that that is likely. And even at Gaugamila, okay, we've come further east. I've got a not my perfect army, but I've got a lot of troops he hasn't fought before. Let's mm -hmm. again choose the spot. Let's overwhelm them with numbers. Let's outmaneuver them with far more cavalry than they've got. These are quite reasonable things to do. In the same way, you know, you could look at the um, the Battle of Pharsalus where uh, mm -hmm. Pompey faces Caesar. His tactics make perfect sense. It's just that you're up against this commander and this incredibly experienced and confident, confident army that can find mm -hmm. a way around it. Um, similarly, the Romans fighting Hannibal in the early years. Right. You know, they're, they're just they're they're outclassed, but there's no reason that they should realize they're outclassed <laughs> until it happens. You know, again, right. hindsight makes it clear, but um, of course, uh, you know, people don't expect this because it's new, it's different. You know, and thinking about these three big set piece battles, you know, the Granicus, Issus, and Gaugamela, you know, as a military historian, historian, um, which of these strikes you as the most interesting or impressive as a victory um, for Alexander's army? I think probably Issus. Although they each have elements in them. Um, again, I, I you know I'd emphasize it in the books. There are these three big battles. Then you've got the Hydaspes there in, uh -huh. in India. And there are no other big pitch battles in Alexander's mm -hmm. career. And, and, you know, you've gone off to Persia and he's fighting much smaller scale most of the time. So there is always the tendency in the same way, um, you know, the Hundred Years' War in the Middle Ages becomes about Cressy and Poitiers and Agincourt, right, right. Um, all won by the English who lose the war. But, you know, it's a hundred years. Okay, it's not constant, but nevertheless, most of the time is not spent in big battles. Mm -hmm. But they draw our attention because they do matter and they are important, but they are not the only aspect of warfare right granicus is interesting because as i say it, it's alexander breaks the rules he attacks across a river having marched there and it's it's a gamble but he wants his battle he's confident he can do it and it, he wins because his troops are better and more aggressive and the one thing you don't do with cavalry is line them up by a river and try and defend you know this is this is the purpose mm -hmm. of of the mobility is is immediately um denied by all of that so mm -hmm. that's interesting but it's it's still a relatively small action i mean he only takes about a third of the macedonian army and it's basically the macedonian troops and a few picked favorites the greek mm -hmm. allies most of the other allies are not there and that's partly because he probably doesn't trust them, but it's also he knows he wants to take the pick of the army, the bit that is really good, and make sure that that first encounter is a clear victory. Because again, he can't afford to fail. And he can't right. even afford a draw. Issus is interesting because the Persians have got behind the Macedonians without either side really realizing this. And Darius's army starts to follow um, Alexander along the coast there, Alexander is able to turn around. What's impressive is that he turns around, he halts the army to rest them, he will then advance, and he will advance across this plain by the sea, gradually deploying the army. But it's the formation change, it's the skill of doing that, maneuvering right in the presence of the enemy whilst they look and watch you, and you end up in the right place, and then you attack across, a again, a small obstacle, and you win. Mm -hmm. um, Gaugamela is interesting because how do you deal with the fact there's far more of them than there are of you they're mostly cavalry at least the, the good stuff they are bound to envelop you so how do you deal with this and mm -hmm. it's striking there it's the only time where you have a second line um, of any significance at all a reserve in a sense although it's almost like marching in a big square because the mm -hmm. idea is that they, they can't get around you or at least they can't uh, roll the army up so I think they're each interesting in their different way. They show the army developing, they show Alexander developing. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I, I dislike and I try to argue against in the book is this tendency to see them as all basically the same. That mm -hmm. what the Macedonian does, army does all the time is lean towards the right, make a gap in the enemy line that, through which Alexander and the companions mm -hmm. steam through um, and break the enemy line and that's it. And, you know, it is, it's interesting, the probability is the first charge Alexander leads is on foot. And hmm. with the high death space, because you don't lead with cavalry right into the mass of formed infantry, it's not a good mm -hmm. thing. And it shows Alexander doing that, then returning, then getting on Bucephalus, and then leading the companions into an enemy that's already... So I think there are hints at a rather more subtle command style than we sometimes allow. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, and that, that picture of the sort of standard Macedonian stretch the enemy out, lean to the right, punch through the gap, mm 
you know, it's extended to Chironea, to all sorts of things where there is no evidence mm-hmm. whatsoever for this being the case. Um, and it doesn't make sense when you look at the sort of armies, the sort of terrain. Um, so again, we almost turn Alexander into something simpler mm-hmm. than he really is because it gives us a nice, neat answer. Um, but I suspect that if we knew more about each of these battles, we would find they're actually different in many respects. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's getting that small detail of, you know, the, there's arguments about where the river is, how far right. the shoreline has changed at Issus, Gaugamila, we don't really know where it was, Granicus, what was the state of the river then? It, it's it's mm-hmm. with all of these things, whereas with a, a modern battlefield, you can go and you can walk it and you can have a fair idea of the topography and how that shaped what was going on. The ancient world, that's, that's almost never possible. Hmm. You know, you mentioned that in, in some ways the most innovative thing the Macedonians did was besiege cities very successfully. Obviously, they're very effective on the, on the field as well. But, you know, Philip kind of pioneers the this siege train that it can take Greek cities for the first time. And Alexander, again, inheriting this army and these skills, um, applies it with great success, um, both they were at, at Tyre and at Gaza and then many, many other less well-known uh, instances. Um what is it that they, they did? What was the new element of siege warfare that Philip and Alexander brought to bear in these instances? I think the first is that they can stay outside an enemy mm-hmm. city for a long time and they don't start to starve. They don't succumb to disease. They seem to organize themselves well enough. So that's part of it. That makes everything else possible. You then have the technology that you can build the mole across the tire. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can you can link it up with the mainland, bring your siege up. When that's destroyed, you can do another one. Mm-hmm. You can put siege engines on ships. You can build siege towers. You can build artillery. There's the development of the more powerful torsion artillery. Mm-hmm. And also a willingness to take losses when you assault. Because the pattern, when you get the descriptions are rarely detailed, apart from Alexander's ones, and then predominantly Tyre and, and Gaza to a lesser extent. But at Gaza, you know, you're tunneling to undermine the walls. That's mm-hmm. new as far as we can tell you. So there's a lot of technology. You're bringing all that to bear, but you're also willing to do what Alexander will later do in in India and climb the ladder and jump onto the rampart and then jump mm-hmm. down into the fortress yeah, when right. the ladder breaks, you know, behind you. There's that aggression. And that means overall the losses you suffer are probably... Not spectacularly high, though if you look at the ones at Tai, you know, they're significant. They're higher than any of the battles, but then mm-hmm. it's a nine-month siege, so you know it's a problem. But many of them will occur. It's the people who are willing to go first up the ladder or across the ramp of the siege tower onto the ramp, they are at very high risk. So you tend to lose a lot of your boldest, and you feel, as you're getting to the later campaigns in India, part of what rubs the edge off the Macedonian army is that They've done this too many times and they know mm-hmm. that the risk, you know, you're rolling the dice so many times, you can't always get lucky and survive mm-hmm. unwounded. Again, something that surprised me because you don't come across it in the Roman sources for um, Roman period is the very high proportion of, of fatalities to wounded in mm-hmm. Alexander's battles where it's sometimes, you know, there are 10 times or even more as many wounded as there are killed, which may just be that they're calling people wounded that wouldn't necessarily be listed as wounded in a in a Roman account. Mm-hmm. Um, you sometimes get that with different armies. If you look at um, Duke of Wellington's army in the Peninsula War, his Portuguese units always suffered a much lower proportion of wounded than the <laughs> British. And it seems to be an accounting method. They just didn't mm-hmm. count. You know, somebody who disappeared for an hour or two, got bandaged and came back, isn't counted, mm-hmm. whereas in a British unit it might be. Because otherwise, everything about them, the way they're acting, is exactly the same. Um so it might be that, but there's also, there's a sense that you can take a lot of risks as Philip and Alexander do because the armor you have and the sort of weapons you're facing means that you have a pretty good chance of not being killed outright. And whether it's a constitutional thing, it's partly the medical treatment you're getting, but you seem to have quite a good chance of surviving all these wounds they acquire mm-hmm. as well and still being healthy. I mean, obviously we don't know about the people who don't. Um but I think there are, uh, in those later campaigns, you have a sense of an army that, that just doesn't want to do this anymore. They've taken these risks so many times. And it's, you know, the spectacular sieges are the ones at the beginning and the, um, mm-hmm. some of the ones in the, the mountains as they're mm-hmm. uh, moving into to India. But there's so many of them. And you're just taking yet another mud wall town. And it's dangerous. And a few of you will get killed and more of you will get wounded. For what? You know, this isn't spectacular. Nobody's heard of these places. 
And when you've taken that one, there always seems to be another one a bit mm -hmm. further along. Um, so, but the siege warfare is critical because without it, you know, again, you can look at it simply and say, well, Alexander wins three battles and the Persians say, right, fair enough, you've won the war, <laughs> we'll give in. In a way that mm -hmm. most ancient states probably would. But you're only able to fight those battles because in the meantime, you've gone on and you've taken city after city. And if they haven't, mm -hmm. if you haven't taken them by siege, they've surrendered to you because they know that you can take them by siege if you're determined mm -hmm. enough to do it. If you decide you're going to do that, then the odds are the place will eventually fall. And, and Tyre is the clearest um, demonstration of that. And even if it depends in part on the breakup of the Persian fleet and the defection of naval squadrons to join Alexander so that he, he has the navy that can blockade the harbours there. Mm -hmm. But it also shows that, you know, it doesn't matter. If, he, if it takes him best part of a year, he is still going to take your city that everyone had thought was impregnable. And that's bound to make you think twice the next time you come along, which is why Babylon and places like this just open their gates. You know, right mm -hmm. when you come, fair enough, king is dead, long live the king. It's it that, <laughs> right. that sort of principle. You mentioned how there's these these umpteen minor actions, often sieges of Munwald villages or kind of minor skirmishes that really make up the the vast bulk of the Macedonians' resume militarily. Um, and, and these are often kind of glossed over in our sources. They're not dramatic. They're not very, you know, rhetorically impressive. Um, but they are really where I think they, Macedonians kind of shine, I guess, most successfully. We kind of see, you know, Alexander's genius at, at work again and again, for better or worse. Um, do any of these minor actions that are often overlooked um, stick out to you as being an interesting example of how the Macedonians did warfare? It's striking because obviously one thing you're not going to have when you're climbing ladders to attack a walled <laughs> city is a pike. Mm, um, right. So, you know, from the very start, the bulk of this phalanx infantry is fighting in a different way or with a different weapon to normal, but they're fighting very well and they're fighting just as aggressively. I think... I suspect a lot of this, again, it's the sort of thing Philip's army has been doing in Illyria, in Thrace, um, mm -hmm. for years. And it's on the same scale. So again, it's something they know about, but it becomes, you know, when you think how long it, he, he campaigns in Bactria, mm -hmm. in Sogdiana, in these areas, and then as you move, in, far more Macedonians are killed in this fighting. And the overall size of the army gets bigger and bigger. But again, because it, it lacks this drama, um, we don't focus on it. It doesn't have the the sort of simple tactics. It doesn't fit the template. But that's, again, as I say, I suspect the battles are more different than we allow. And if the more we knew, the more we'd realize that. But mm -hmm. the, the thing is that situation after situation is different that Alexander faces. And yet with the same army, the same troops, he finds a way of winning. Whether it's, yes, sometimes it's finding the route up so you can get above the city in the clouds, mm -hmm. it's, um, but it's also, they can build something or they can do something or they can find a way that always means you can win. They do not quit. They do not give up. And even enemies that win successes against, you know, there are those defeats. There are the Macedonian mm -hmm. columns that are, are destroyed. You go back and you pummel that enemy into submission and you hunt down all of the satraps that are still fighting. You hunt down the local mm -hmm. leaders who appear. So it's, it's less dramatic. And often, again, it's Alexander not necessarily with the whole army, but mm -hmm. with a detachment of it. But he does show by this time, he's clearly very good at everything. And he's also, by this time, the army does know him. And they know that just mm -hmm. as they used to believe with Philip in charge, we're bound to win. They know deep in their bones that with Alexander in charge, we're going to win. There's always a way around. So it's it's an odd mixture because... The sources don't emphasize that much all the allied troops that he's added mm -hmm. to the army by this time. By the time you get to India, you know, in theory, if the figures are right, the army is massive and you've got horse archers and all this sort of thing. And they do feature a little bit at high aspects, but they don't in the more general accounts, in the in the way that in the past, you know, you've often had specific mention of the squadron of so-and-so, the companions, or mm -hmm. the phalanx battalion of a named commander. You get less of that as time goes on. There's a sense the army's bigger. Um, and even though these engagements are smaller, that it's a bit less personal. But that's mm -hmm. probably a reflection of the sources also finding it confusing to tell this story. Right. You know, when you think the amount of space they devote to the big campaigns against Persia compared to the wars that actually last longer, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's, it's the modern tendency. I mean, it's, it's one thing whenever... Um, <laughs> 
when you come to write about it, but also, you know, quite a few times I've, I've worked on TV documentaries about Hannibal. Mm -hmm. There is a great tendency for the the whole, all their screen time to be devoted to getting across the Alps into Italy, <laughs> right. which is the start of the war. But it's that wonderful story. And it's mm -hmm. the bit everybody knows about. And it's the same with Alexander and Persia. We focus on those early years and we forget what goes on later on because it, it's, uh, it does get repetitive. I mean, I, I found it roaching. And I, I, I think I say somewhere in the book that, you know, I, I do this deliberately and I keep on saying, this is where they are. This is what they're doing because it matters. But it is essentially the same thing again and again. You come to an area, the locals mm -hmm. don't submit. You find a way to defeat them. There are more and more massacres later on. You know, it, there is a brutality about this. And it's partly a reflection mm -hmm. of the, the very loose political organization that you can't simply knock out a, a great king and expect everybody else to surrender. Mm -hmm. Taking one town, one hilltop village doesn't mean that the one 10 miles away is going to surrender to you because they didn't like mm -hmm. those people in the first place. So they, and they are absolutely <laughs> confident. And again... As the Persian War develops, there is a sense that people get a, get some idea of, yes, this is Alexander, we've got to be careful, this is how we fight him. Most of the people they encounter later on don't know who the Macedonians are. They don't know who Alexander mm -hmm. is. So they do think when some, some load of foreigners turn up and tell them what to do, <laughs> well, of course we're going to fight. You know, wouldn't anybody? Um, right, they don't right. realize what they're up against. No, it is, you know, the, the sheer reach and the, the duration of the campaign, it must like seem like a distant plague, you know, on the horizon. They suddenly show mm. up and, you know, and <clears throat> just overwhelm everybody. But, but as you said, there's always one more hilltop village, which mm. must have been, yeah, just enervating. Yes, so. I mean, it, it's, and of course, some of these troops, I mean, some of Alexander's veterans are going to go on for fighting years after his death in right, the, right. the wars of the successors. Mm -hmm. uh, these are, you know, people, you, you have to think that humanly you can understand this repeated cry for, well, you know, let's go home. We've won mm -hmm. this. We don't mind fighting for you again sometime in the future, but let's have a rest. Because with Philip's campaign, there had been those frequent returns home. And even in that, you know, that unique incident in the, the first winter, Mm -hmm. in 334 when men newly married are allowed to oh, go yes. back home to try and mm -hmm. father the next generation of Macedonian soldiers, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. But there, there is that sense that you've had an army that, yes, it's semi-permanent, but actually you've still got a strong link to all these garrison towns and cities that Philip's organized to mm -hmm. your Macedonian families, to the land, to that, that has been practical when you've been campaigning in the sort mm -hmm. of the broader area of, the, of, of Greece and the, the surrounding lands. But when you're getting so far away, um, it becomes harder. And when there seems no end in sight at all, you know, mm -hmm. it is odd. Alexander doesn't seem to read the the mood of his men where time and again, he'll sort of tell them, oh, we've, to win the war, we've got to go and capture Bessus. We've got to go and defeat mm -hmm. him. So just a little bit further and then it'll be all right. But when he does suddenly decide to send contingents home, whether it's the Greeks, whether it's the mm -hmm. Thessalians who volunteered later on, in the middle of nowhere... And in the sort of middle of a campaign, it's suddenly, right, fair enough, you've been complaining, off you go. And I'll reward you. But, you know, you're months and months away from getting back to the Mediterranean at best. And it's mm -hmm. a long, difficult task to find your way back home and feed yourself all the way home. It's that, you know, you have these odd mixtures, the stories of Alexander, you know, leading the, um, the snow blind soldier up to his place mm -hmm. by the fire, sitting right, the man right. on his stool and, you know, the shock when, oh, I'm sitting in the king's place and don't worry, it's fine, you know, we're Macedonians, not Persians, or waiting for them to come across the desert, you know, as everybody mm -hmm. comes. In. So you have these moments of incredible empathy of setting an example, the, obviously later on the famous one of pouring out the, the water from the oh, helmet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but also these incredibly insensitive moments where he just doesn't seem to have a clue. So he's he's an odd mixture, or the tradition about him presents this odd mixture mm -hmm. of a character. Well, but I suspect it, sheer exhaustion is part of it for everybody, Alexander included. Well, well sure, you know, and there's this moment, of course, after Hadaspes where they they do refuse to go on, you know, somewhere deep in what's now Pakistan. And Alexander apparently is furious, you know, desperate to continue on, where but his men, you know, just have had enough. And one wonders about, you know, obviously we can't only speak, we can only speculate about his motivations at this point, but, you know, was this for him just an indefinitely movable feast? You know, this kind of just continues until the world stops. I wonder, I mean, partly it's got to be habit by this time, because this is all mm -hmm. he's done for a long, long time. Mm 
And he knows he's good at it. And he knows that each problem he comes across, yes, I can win. I can find a way around. Hurrah, mm -hmm. let's have another party to celebrate. You know, it's and reward men and everybody cheers me. And mm -hmm. it's great. If he stops anywhere, I mean, the, the, the problem, the friction, whether it's the, the pages, whether it's killing Clytus, all of these things mm -hmm. happen whenever they stop and pause for a bit and have time to think. And they very quickly get on each other's nerves. Mm -hmm. um, but also you do wonder, you know, we're told in the ancient sources that Alexander wrote a lot of letters, many of which survived in the ancient world, though they don't to us. But you do have to wonder, he's carved out this huge empire and there will be lots of people wanting him to do things. You know, the nature of ancient rule is that kings, people come to kings, to emperors mm -hmm. with problems, with petitions. They have, you have power, therefore we want you to sort things out for us. So Alexander, if ever he stops, has to actually face up to the task of organizing this vast empire. What sort of regime do you want to create? Now, he's got Philip's model, which is you never really stop for that long. You just keep going. Mm -hmm. So that's partly that as well. But I think it's become more intense because you're just going. The distances are so much, so much bigger. You know, if you do decide to turn around and go back home, you know, he fights lots of campaigns on the way back to the heartland of the empire, mm -hmm. even when everybody seems to have, okay, we're going back now. But there's <laughs> a, it doesn't stop the fighting. It is such a long way. Mm -hmm. But there are so many problems to deal with, and he has to face up to responsibility in the longer run, you know, like the sudden decision to, to marry um, mm -hmm. that happens later on and starting that. And then the big, you know, the mass ceremony with oh, the, right, the right. senior officers um, and taking, you know, more wives for himself. Okay, one day there needs to be another Macedonian, there needs to be another king, whether he's a Macedonian king or whether he's king of this great empire. You do half wonder if there's an element of, if I keep going, I don't have to think about these things. I don't have to do the dull work. Mm -hmm. I don't have to govern this empire to quite the same way. I can make a few decisions, people will come to me, I'll have to write letters, but basically the day-to-day -day stuff is done by somebody else. And mm -hmm. I can do the bit I like, the bit I know, the bit I understand, which is going on exploring and fighting. So, uh, yes, I mean, that, that I don't buy the idea, you know, there is this theory that Alexander sets up the mutiny at the, at the Hyphasis and that he doesn't want to go mm -hmm. any further, but he wants an excuse so that people say, you know, he's not turned back by anything but his own army. Um, I don't buy that. It doesn't make sense. I'm sure he could easily have found a good pretext to say, well, let's go back and we'll make sure we've got the southern part of the Persian Empire or let's go mm -hmm. and explore the sea route, all these sorts of things. Um you have to wonder as well, you know, you're in India in the monsoon season as well uh, by this time. And I've never experienced it, but just looking at film footage of it, you know, that looks mm -hmm. like one of those times you think, I, I, I really don't want to be marching oh, yeah, in right. an army and doing it. I don't want to be doing anything <laughs> in this. So it's, and conditions that no Macedonian or Greek would ever have dreamed of. You know, it is a very alien environment. Mm -hmm. And as they get the knowledge that India is a lot bigger than they thought it was, and, it, you know, it is very noticeable that even in the sources later on that we have preserved, there are still so many weird, tall tales told about India. Right. You know, the gold digging ants and all this sort mm -hmm. of stuff, or the, the giants. And um, it's it has that sort of same quality of stories about the new world in the, you know, the 16th century, that, that people believe almost anything mm -hmm. about this. It's still, it's not quite Persia somehow. We sort of understand, yes, it's alien. Yes, it's a bit different, but this is... This is just not quite real. This is, you know, the Romans will tell similar stories about Britain. You know, mm -hmm. though, even when they'd had some contact with it, you get stories of you know, people with, with no heads, but their faces in their chests and this sort of thing, right. and, and, you know, half beasts. And mm -hmm. it's still, to some extent, the unknown. So I think there are lots of factors. But I, to me, I think Alexander wanted to go on and it's just the army that says they've had enough. Um, and that's the only way to explain it. I, I just don't think this is... I, if he tried to stage manage this, this is incredibly botched and mismanaged. It, 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 he doesn't look good. You know, he doesn't come out well in the sources for this. All right. You know, it's often presented, I think, in our sources as this, you know, this pothos, the desire to continue, you know, just because the nature of who he is, is, you know, Alexander and Nikitos and Conqueror and whatever else. But, you know, I, I think you're right that it's almost escapism to some degree, that he doesn't want to deal with the minutiae of, you know, managing a great empire. For him, it's the excitement and, you know, the the thrill of endless conquest. Well, you have the story that's it's it's uh, first told of Alexander, then subsequently of Hadrian, of 
mm-hmm. them riding through a town. This old woman calls out oh, the yes, petition. Yes. And um, mm-hmm. they say, sorry, I haven't got time to deal with you now. And the answer is, well, stop being king or stop exactly, being emperor. Exactly, right. Mm-hmm. It is dull. I mean, that, that's the, the striking thing. And obviously the Roman context is different or much later on. But if you look at people like Augustus, it's a terrible job ruling mm-hmm. this. You are doing very dull stuff all the time. And you're the other the other great problem, I think, particularly from the Greco-Roman experience, the Greek world, is that anyone who comes to want something from you has, if they are not an orator themselves, they've brought one along. So nothing can be done <laughs> briefly. You know, this is not the simple oh, right. note of I'd like this. This is <laughs> listening to a very long, florid speech again and mm-hmm. again and again, and great ceremony and great theater about it all, which is important to people. But it must make it incredibly hard, but particularly for an Alexander who's got used to the idea, I make a decision and tell people to do it, they do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's clearly the shock as well. It's those few occasions where his men don't do it, they don't obey. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, again, <laughs> I keep saying I'm not going to speculate about that, but this is where I think you can legitimately ask some questions and say, well, the, suggest possibilities. But again, we don't know. Um, you come back to this this mysterious Alexander with nearly all the sources written 400 plus years later, uh, by which time, and even then you've got the shorter term manipulation of the past, both by him and then under the successors, mm-hmm. when everybody is trying to prove how legitimate they are and all the things that um, makes you like Alexander, but if possible, a bit better than Alexander, <laughs> therefore people support you as king. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's so, you know, it's hard enough to know what Caesar was doing. With Alexander, it, it's so much more difficult um, because you don't get his own words. You don't get a sense of the man. Well, right, you know, and uh, at the risk of pushing you further into speculation. <laughs> so obviously Alexander is, is spared from the stultifying routine of rulership by being by dying or being mm. assassinated, probably just dying at the age of 32 in Babylon. Um, and uh, you know, we have all of these descriptions about what he was planning to do. Obviously, he had this this inv- invasion of Arabia planned. We think that 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 seems to be fairly straightforward. But there's talk of you know going on to Carthage or whatever else. Um, I mean, how much do we know legitimately about what he was planning to do? Was that firm in his own mind? You think, or probably not? I suspect he had his mm-hmm. plans. It, it's you know, he is about the expedition has been prepared. He's about to leave when he falls ill. So mm-hmm. the Arabian expedition is clearly there. Um, and makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's 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 the sort of easiest thing for him to do that's still a huge task. Because mm-hmm. the big problem is, you know, there's the story told about Alexander when he's young, hearing of Philip's latest victory and getting depressed and his friends mm-hmm. say why, and it's because he's leaving me so little to do. Uh, you know, Philip posthumously gets downgraded because he doesn't do what Alexander does. He doesn't live long enough, mm-hmm. which means that we, you know, we forget just how spectacular his achievements are. But there is the problem. Once you go and conquer the greatest empire in the world, what do you do next? Mm-hmm. Um, and with this culture of excelling, of being first, and uh, uh, you don't maybe don't want to push it too far, but you know this is the man who views the Iliad as this inspirational mm-hmm. text as well as everything else, and has this annotated copy that he's you know he's has under his pillow. Mm-hmm. But lots of Greeks, lots of people in different situations, as will many Romans, could feel inspired in their day-to-day lives by the the exemplar of these heroes. So there is that sense that, you know, it is all about being famous, doing more. And it's like any athlete setting a record. Once you've done it, you've got to go better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite hard. So I think Arian's comment that, you know, it'd be nothing small scale, whatever Alexander was planning... The problem is, obviously, is that in the immediate aftermath of his death, people have got all sorts of reasons for announcing this is what he was planning and Mm -hmm. aren't you glad he died because that would have been terrible or this is what he was planning and isn't it terrible that the people claiming to be the rightful successors of Alexander have not done this? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you do feel that, again, like Philip, you know, he's younger than Philip. The, he would, under normal circumstances, have expected to live on a long time. The the idea that the the wounds suffered in India is crippling just doesn't seem to work with the accounts of what he does. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's in the Gudrosian Desert, but other operations, he is a very active man. So he's not been permanently crippled. Um, he doesn't, you know, he's not someone who's going to struggle to go on campaign again. So it's all there, and it's. Again, what else can an Alexander do apart from conquer more? So you have to look for the next likely opponent. 
um, somebody worth doing. So it's, I think what he's doing is perhaps more Macedonian in the sense, more like Philip, he's giving them a bit of a rest before he goes on to the next stage. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's an element of snobbery in all of this in the same way that um, you know, the Romans like to consider themselves descended from the Trojans and all this sort of things, mm -hmm. that they can sort of work their way into that great epic. <laughs> right. The idea you get the Roman tradition that maybe Alexander was looking at Italy, mm, maybe right. he was, but it's the sort of thing you feel, ah, oh, yes, you know, he, he would have, but he would have had a different task with us and all this sort of thing. And mm -hmm. um, the Alexander story is so big, so powerful that you want to be part of it. So it does mean... Um, there's all sorts of reasons for inventing this, but I, I think it's uh, it's clearly never possible for any of the successors to conquer on the scale again, and nobody else in the ancient world. I mean, nobody conquers so much land so quickly. For all the spectacular achievements of Pompey and Caesar and people like this, mm -hmm. it's much more methodical because it, it, it's the situation is not there. There isn't something equivalent to the Achaemenid Empire you can go and attack, and that is at a particularly weak moment in its history, and mm. you're at a particularly strong moment in your history where everything just fits in for this to happen. And on top of that, you've got Philip and Alexander who make sure it happens. You know, without them, it might not have done. So uh, you can't remove the personality from the story and from the calculation when Alexander is essentially all about that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's doing all of this to be spectacular and it's about reputation, it's about achievement, and he is celebrating himself all the way through. And uh, again, you're coming back to this, this, this problem Philip faced. Well, if you don't keep fighting successful wars, how do you reward people? What mm -hmm. other way is there of bonding together um, your own aristocracy, let alone all your allies? Mm -hmm. And you've now got these fabulous resources. You've got all this money. You've got all this manpower. You've got this you know, the phalanx of um, successors, these Persian children that you've educated mm -hmm. as Macedonians, you've raised, you've drilled in, and again, an incredibly tactless way. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you're not doing this just for the, the sake of it. Um, the way that Philip has bound his allies and conquest together is by going off and finding somebody else to fight. So there's probably a sense that Alexander can't wait too long. You do wonder, you know, you do have indigenous rebellions under the successors, particularly under the Seleucids. Mm -hmm. um, would that have started to happen if Alexander had lived longer? Would it have been more marked? So unless you can motivate them to do something else. So th there's a whole mixture. But again, it's it's like all the what-ifs of history. We just don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, of course, one of those wonderful, you know, chestnuts of what ifery. you know, either he goes to Italy, you know, and mm. fights various Roman generals, like Livy says, you know, or goes off to China or whatever else, you know, these, uh, you mentioned Alexander sort of keeps going till he's 80 and just drops dead in the saddle <laughs> somewhere, you know, in Siberia or something. Um, but anyway, you know, so thinking about the legacy of Alexander, um, which of course is so great, you know, so vast, almost un unparalleled really in ancient history. Uh, you know, Plutarch pairs um, Alexander with Caesar, you know, in his parallel lives. Um, how apt do you think that comparison is of these two conquerors and kings? It's interesting because Appian does the same thing, right? He, almost at the same mm -hmm. time when he comes to Caesar's death, he goes and has a passage comparing him to Alexander. I think they are, in each case, the most spectacularly successful general produced by mm -hmm. either side. But you know, Caesar is a very different figure in that, I guess, he ends up as dictator for life and there's all the rumors, does he want to be king or not? But he isn't the ruler of Rome until a, mm -hmm. a very, he's a much more conventional politician. It's the military aspect. But again, you have the stories told about Caesar of seeing the bust of Alexander and weeping because, right, right. you know, he'd conquered the world and I haven't done anything in my life, this sort of thing. Um, it's difficult. I mean, the Plutarch's choices are odd in that it's... It's striking, and again, it's probably the Alexander ripple effect that, as far as we know, he didn't write a life of Philip. Mm -hmm. That you would think under any other circumstances, surely this man would have demanded to be included. You know, he's more important than many of the others that mm -hmm. the Plutarch does choose. So um, it's, I think it makes sense, but it's also a sign of just how different Rome is to mm -hmm. Macedonia. Um, and, you know, in terms of sheer distance, in terms of area conquered, Caesar conquers Gaul, and then mm. he wins lots of battles in the Civil War. And yes, he raids Britain and he crosses the Rhine, but, you know, that is small fry in terms of <laughs> sheer area. 
to what Alexander does. But on the other hand, he fights a lot more battles than Alexander in a short time. Um, mm -hmm. The world is different. Um, he campaigns in a different area and he doesn't have the resources. He can't just do what he feels like. You know, you mm -hmm. have the, the striking difference is you have commentaries written by Caesar on his campaigns where at every stage he is trying to convince his audience this is the right thing to do for Rome. That's yes, right. I'm a good Roman magistrate doing what I should be doing. This is in the interest of the state. It's in the interest of our allies. Protecting our allies is in the interest of the Republic. Therefore, I go off and do this and suddenly I go and pacify Brittany or I go and raid mm -hmm. Britain and all these sort of things that you know, presumably was not in anybody's mind when the Senate, <laughs> you know, and he's chosen to, yeah, right. to go there in the first place. Um, and of course, we can see more flaws and mistakes Caesar made because he's got this, he's given us this detailed account mm -hmm. that even though it's very um, favorable to himself is also quite honest because it had to be because plenty of people had written home right. telling him what was going on. So it's, it's odd. I mean, they are very different people having careers in very different eras, but they are still, we remember Alexander the Great today and how many other Macedonian kings get remembered or how many other Greeks at all get right. remembered today. We remember Caesar today, and um, you know, let's face it, it's it's barely a century ago. You had a Kaiser and a Tsar. People mm -hmm. were still using because, and again, that's not really because of Julius Caesar. It's because of Augustus mm -hmm. um, that you you know. I've often had the problem with books where you've asked for pictures of various people, and some researchers gone on the internet, tapped in Caesar, got seven hundred hits, and thought that's a nice face. <laughs> let's choose that one because again, if you don't know, you don't know that all these people are take the name that it becomes a title. You know, mm -hmm. the whole "I am not king but Caesar" that he's um, supposed to say. It's true in his day when it's a family name, but it ceases to be. It becomes this this symbol of power in the same way that Alexander can appear as the perfect general, the perfect commander, even in the sort of medieval, early modern sense, the perfect gentleman, the perfect knight. Mm -hmm. You know, you, he can be reinvented. The Alexander romance, something I, I deliberately mm -hmm. did not use at all, or other than one, I think it creeps into one or two of the end notes because there's just a few little fragments where you think, okay, I'll, I'll allow for that, like the <laughs> yeah. color of his eyes and this sort of thing. <laughs> But we forget just how popular this was um, and how the name, you know, Sikandar, Alexander, in all mm -hmm. its various forms, spreads throughout the world. Um, it, the image of Alexander becomes this ideal, both as, both as hero and villain. And Caesar does, to some extent, that, although that's probably a sort of post-Shakespeare thing that adds to mm -hmm. the, the, the sense of, of his name. But again, he, he mystifies the Romans. You know, there is that sense that any Roman commander, let alone an emperor, who talks about a campaign in the Eastern Empire against the Parthians, against the Sassanian Persians, immediately the sources start talking about Alexander, you know, and this right. is what you're mm -hmm. going to do, whether it's Gaius Caesar under Augustus or anybody, you know, Caracalla is supposedly forms this, this legion mm -hmm. of Alexandrian style soldiers, you know, what he thinks the phalanx yeah, war and right, trains yeah. them that way, the, the invincible legion of Alexander the Great. Um, so... Alexander has set the bar so high and no Roman can ever meet that. And, you know, you have Pompey wearing one of Alexander's cloaks so he believed mm -hmm. in triumph. Um, so the Romans, they, they have that general sort of inferiority complex about Greece anyway, <laughs> the sense that, yes, we may be more successful, but they're just posher than us. They're more cultured, they're more sophisticated. <laughs> and Alexander is the sort of the military and the royal example of that, that he is so much more successful. But again, it's it's ambiguous. There are the there's the tradition of this this man's a monster and a tyrant mm. and a savage to the well, yeah, but look how good he was at doing it. And <laughs> isn't this amazing? And the, the sheer distance is involved. So I think Alexander has that influence and Caesar does to some extent. So I think they they do probably fit as the most famous Greek and the most Roman, even though of course neither of them is typical of right their day and their age and their the consequences um but you can understand and of course there is that problem that even though plutarch is writing in the second century a.d he is on the whole i mean there are you get lives of some of the the emperors in the, the civil war period but basically imperial history is out of bounds mm -hmm. <laughs> everything after caesar is just a bit too sensitive you don't talk right, about yeah. that so again you can reinvent this this wonderful romanticized past um, and in the same way they have with Alexander and the Romans keep doing it. And it's no coincidence. All these people in the second century AD are writing about Alexander mm -hmm. and go on doing so.
Oh, that's very interesting. I think about these two iconic but wildly eccentric characters at the same time, you know, who, whose fame is, you know, both, you know, owning their accomplishments and the fact that they were kind of cut off, I think, at the height of their careers mm-hmm. as part of it. You know, they're, they're the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. uh, right, right. Princess um, Diana, it's the same exactly, thing. Exactly. You, know, you right, die you when know. you're young. There's never a picture of you when you're old. Right, right. Um, you know. Which Augustus manages by exactly, just stopping anybody right. from having pictures of him when he's old. Yeah, right. No, I, I am still 30 years old. <laughs> exactly. Know, old, yeah, that's fine. Guy, <laughs> yes. you know. um, well, anyway, this has been absolutely wonderful. Dr. Goldsworthy, thanks so much. Um, I, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure my uh, listeners will look forward. Uh, I appreciate all of this. Um, for much, much more, um, check out the book, um, Philip and Alexander, Kings and Conquerors, and Dr. Goldsworthy. Dr. Goldsworthy's other books, which are at his website, um, adriangoldsworthy.com. Um, so, Dr. Goldsworthy, thank uh, you so um, much. If you don't mind me fitting in a oh, plug, yes. the next one coming out next oh, go for summer it. is it's going to be called Roman Persia. And it oh, looks wonderful. at the encounter, it's, it's sort of logical successor to Alexander, from the mm-hmm. first Roman encounter under Sulla with the Parthians right the way through to the 7th century mm-hmm. and the collapse of the Sassanian Empire and the, the beginning of the uh, conquest. So, it's trying to look at that story as a whole and look at these two empires and just see how they're related to each other. And it it Mm -hmm. certainly surprised me when I was writing it. It wasn't what I expected to find in many cases. But again, the specter of Alexander is sort of marching through this all the way. But Mm -hmm. you soon realize that actually nobody's really trying to do that. They talk about (laughs) it a lot, but they are are far happier. They they have far more limited objectives in all their conquests. And neither side most of the time really wants to conquer the other at all. It's just trying to sort of control their own empire and their own border states. That's where the problem is. So that's, that's next summer. Well, that's fascinating. I look forward to reading that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Take, take Antioch, take, take Tisiphon, you know, and everyone's happy. But uh, mm. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that'll be a fascinating read. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, and to everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks for having me.